All right, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 14th. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim. I am sponsored uh, by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython part-time. Um, if you don't know what CircuitPython is, this is a version of Python that is designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. And the, let's see here, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord channel. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, this meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday. Uh, in the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar that you can add uh, to your favorite calendar application to get um, you know, notifications about when these meetings are up, uh, coming up and especially the ones that do occur uh, on the Tuesdays, which is what will happen if there happens to be a US holiday on Monday. Generally, we bump it to the same time on Tuesday. Um, I did not look at the calendar for next week, but I believe we're on Monday, and I'll take a peek at that by the time we get to the end. So in the wrap up, I will let folks know for sure uh, if next week is the normal time or not. There's a notes document that accompanies the meeting and the recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the notes to view only the parts that interest you most. This meeting does tend to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we will post a link to the next, uh, next week's meeting notes in the CircuitPython dev channel. Again, that's on Discord. So check the pinned messages there to find the latest notes doc. You can also add your notes uh, for next week's meeting. Uh, and I will just add, you can, um, this note stock gets created generally shortly after the weekly meetings on Mondays. So you can actually add your stuff ahead of time. If you want to add notes in throughout the week, you can definitely do that. Uh, if you wish to participate but cannot attend, then you can leave your hug reports and your status updates in that document and we will read them during the meeting. So. Uh, this meeting will go in five main parts. The first part is going to be community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. This is a preview of the Python on microcontrollers newsletter, which generally comes out uh, on Tuesdays. The second part uh, of the meeting is going to be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at things by the numbers uh, and separate it out from the, the specific stuff that we're all into in our status updates and stuff like that. So the third part then is hug reports. This is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks are doing. Take some time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. This one, uh, Hug Reports, is the first of our two round robins, the next of which is uh, the fourth part, which is status updates. This is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been doing. Um, you can take a couple of minutes, talk about what you've done in the past week since the previous meeting and what you will be up to in the next week until the next meeting. And the fifth and final part is called In the Weeds, and this is an opportunity for those long-form discussions. These can come out of status updates or be something that is identified ahead of time as uh, likely to be too long for status updates. Um, so that covers how the meeting will go. So next up is going to be community news. Let me get a timestamp, and then we will get going on that. There we go. Uh, so this week in community news, uh, we had CircuitPython 7.2.1 released. Uh, I believe maybe that was released earlier today or possibly yesterday. Um, so there's links here to the GitHub release and there's a short list of the notable fixes uh, since 7.2.0. So I'll read a couple of those. Uh, we have uh, Espressif I2C pull-up detection fix. We have a fix for the SAMD21 to improve the auto reload reliability uh, when you save your CodePy file or any other files for that matter. We updated the uh, trusted certificates within CircuitPython um, for making HTTP requests. We fixed uh, CountIO problems when it is used outside of code.py. Uh, and then lastly, um, it was added to the core so that we can use the from future import annotations, which is something that is typically used in CPython. So this gives us the ability to make our code compatible between CircuitPython and CPython with regards to all of the typing work that we're doing lately. So uh, thank you to everyone who worked on any contributions to CircuitPython that got us to 721. 
Uh, next up, this is the uh, a new Arduino Nikla version. The new Arduino Nikla, oh, excuse me, Vision, not version, uh, Arduino Nikla Vision. This is a, a new type of device. Uh, so the Arduino Nikla Vision is a ready-to-use 2-megapixel standalone camera that lets you analyze and process images uh, on the edge for advanced machine learning and edge computing applications. It's listed as Python and Arduino compatible. It integrates OpenMV support. Uh, excuse me, it integrates OpenMV and supports MicroPython and features uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth low energy connectivity. Uh, next up is, oops, let me get a timestamp here. Next up is going to be uh, the implementation of the language Forth on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, Forth is certainly not one of the most modern programming languages, but it does take into account for limited resources, uh, and there is now an implementation of the fourth language for the Raspberry Pi Pico, and there are links there in the notes to Twitter and uh, Hackaday, it looks like, as well. Uh, next up is the Tom's Hardware Piecast is coming up with special guest Paul Cutler, uh, which is the host of the Circuit Python show. Uh, which uh, there will also be a new CircuitPython show coming up this week. Um, so check out uh, that discussion with Paul on the Tom's Hardware Piecast. There are links here in the notes for YouTube and Twitter. Next up, uh, Adafruit's own Ann Barella will be joining the Python Bytes uh, stream podcast. This episode, um, actually... Yeah, I was about to say the date. I don't know the exact date, actually, but I encourage you to hit the link in the notes to find out when that will be. Um, uh, so let's see here. Python Bytes episode. This is going to be number 274 and includes discussion uh, 12, sec 12 questions you should be asking of your dependencies. Uh, and of course, we'll feature, as I mentioned, our own Ann Barella, the editor uh, of the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is where all of the rest of these items and many more will appear uh, this week. Uh, a couple more we have. Uh, so let's go timestamp here. Uh, Jeff and Melissa, uh, two of the CircuitPython developers, spoke, uh, I believe, last week or the week prior at the Dublin Linux Developers Meetup, and the video is now available. So there is a link in YouTube to catch that talk if you are interested. Uh, and then the last one I believe this is here uh, is the Apoca Pi Now. The Apoca Pi Now is a luggable, rugged, EMP-proof Raspberry Pi portable. Uh, it's basically like a little cyber deck, uh, which I am definitely a sucker for cyber deck, so I thought this was a really cool-looking device, and so I included this one in here, and I encourage you to take a look. There are some links here to Hackster.io, Reddit, and Twitter. All right, so that is the community news, and this is all, again, going to be part of the weekly newsletter. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter that's emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com. There is a link in the notes if you want to hit that. Uh, it highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, uh, CPython, and MicroPython developments. You can contribute your own news uh, by making a pull request on GitHub under the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter repository, uh, or you can send news to cpnews at adafruit.com, um, or you could also try uh, tagging Anne here on Discord or Twitter, uh, but the pull request and the email, I think, are the sort of primary uh, ways to get your news in the newsletter. Uh, so next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Um, so overall, this week we had 44 pull requests merged. Uh, we had 21 authors working on all of those. Um, I failed to go through here and pick out uh, names ahead of time, but just skimming through right now, a couple of the ones that I don't recognize are Five Tied, uh, Bab Lok B, um, Ezio Meloti, C.D. Wilson, um, let's see, Rick Sorensen, uh, D.G. Rizwo, uh, Circuit Art, uh, W.H.O.G. Ben, Texelis. Yeah, those are the uh, names of folks that I don't recognize. So thank you to all of them, and of course everyone else who contributed this week uh, anywhere in the Circuit Python ecosystem. 
We had uh, 11 reviewers, uh, so thank you to all of our reviewers. Um, those look mostly like the usual suspects, I think, so thank you to everyone who's doing reviews for us. Um, we had 39 closed issues by 15 people, and 13 were opened by 10 people. Uh, so next up, I will pass it off to Scott, I believe, to tell us about the core. Hello. So I'll, I'll read the numbers for the core. Um, 21 pull requests merged, which is awesome, from nine different authors. So thank you to all of those. Uh, the new folks here in this list are Fab, uh, Rick Sorensen, Circuit Art. Uh, so thank you to those new folks uh, in the nine authors. We had four reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. Uh, we have 10 open poll requests currently. Uh, the oldest is 179 days old, um, and then it's kind of a smooth gradation there, not a whole lot of new stuff. So thank you to everybody for working through those. Issues-wise, we had 13 closed issues by five people and six open by five people. Um, so we're net down seven, which is good, uh, for a total of 505 open issues. Uh, we're slowly growing uh, in the number of issues, but a lot of those we think are like good long-term things, but not super urgent. So that's okay. Uh, we're okay growing is the issue count, but not necessarily the pull request count. Uh, we have seven active milestones. We use milestones for triaging issues as they come in. Um, and we have one open for 7.2x and then four open for 7.3.0. Um, so pretty good overall. Um, on the milestone front, and uh, we'll just double check. This says we have one issue not assigned a milestone. Those are the ones that we we want to make sure and get categorized and looked at. Um, but that mon number might be a little bit different between me checking my email this morning and uh, the, these numbers being snagged. So uh, that's it for the core. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, I will mm -hmm. pass it over to Katney next to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Tim. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras. Across all of those repos, we had 17 pull requests merged by 11 authors and nine reviewers. The oldest closed PR was 28 days old, uh, which is good. We're still getting through the older ones. And that leaves us with 19 open pull requests. Um, we had 20 issues. <clears throat> closed by 11 people and six open by five people, leaving us with 614 open issues. 207 of those are good first issues. If you're looking to contribute to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, um, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests and open issues. If you are interested in contributing uh, by reviewing, check out the open PRs. Leave us a comment. Let us know you took a look at it. Test it if you have the hardware, etc. Uh, if you're looking to contribute code or documentation, check out the issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to answer questions. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had two new libraries, uh, TT21100, and VL53L4CD. Um, and then a number of updated libraries, which I will not read off. And that's where we are with the libraries. All right, thanks, Katni. Uh, I will add to that briefly. I will be making uh, my way through some more of those open PRs. So if anybody listening does have open PRs on libraries and you think you need help or you just need somebody to take another look again, please feel free to ping me, uh, foamy guy, on. Uh, in the Discord or on the uh, the PR. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had six pull requests merged by five authors and three reviewers. There are currently five open pull requests amongst other repositories. And there were six closed issues by four people and one open by one person, leaving a net of 69 open issues. There were 13,645 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 87 boards. And that's it. Alrighty, thanks, Melissa. We are marching our way up towards 100. 
so next up is the hug reports section. So I will start and then we will go down the list alphabetically in uh, as the names appear in the notes doc. Uh, so I'll take a timestamp for hug reports and my hug reports this week. Uh, thank you to Liz, uh, Blood City DIY, who is joining us in the meeting here. Um, for authoring a fantastic learn guide about MIDI for makers. Uh, MIDI was something I've been sort of peripherally aware of for a little while, but never uh, knew the specifics and never really got in and played around with. Uh, Liz has a really, really great learn guide in the Adafruit Learn system uh, that explains all the details of MIDI and gives tons of good examples, which got me up to speed when I started playing with it last week. So thank you to Liz. Um, Everybody who uh, tuned in or participated in the chat during my first deep dive this past Friday, uh, especially for sticking with me through a bumpy start while I figured out how to get the YouTube up and running. Um, and then lastly, uh, my hug report this week goes out to Jose David, who published a little while back actually, but I had not found it before, a uh, initial working version of a DisplayIO slider widget. So a little handle that you can slide back and forth, sort of like a, a virtual version of a linear potentiometer. Um, which I found to be super useful and fun, and uh, I've got some more plans for that in the future, so thanks to, um, to Jose. Uh, so next up is uh, Blitz City DIY. Um, so my hug report this week is for Katni. Uh, she's been helping me out a lot today, because uh, my today's my first day uh, full-time with Adafruit, so she's been helping me get to speed with all things Slack, Learn, etc. So thank you, Katni. Excellent. Thanks, Liz, and uh, congratulations and welcome. That's very exciting. Um, next up is uh, Dan H., who it looks like is not joining us today, so I'll read Dan's. Oops, let me put a timestamp. Uh, so uh, this week, Dan has hug reports for Scott for the USB host work, as well as Deshipu for supporting 9-bit SPI displays. Uh, and next up is Jepler. All right, I've got a few things here. I want to thank Katni for getting the ball rolling on PyCon attendance. Um, to Julia Evans, who I guess goes by Bork on Twitter, for a recent blog post entitled Celebrate Tiny Learning Milestones. Uh, Julia constantly reminds readers that learning is a journey. You should remember to celebrate your advances even in small increments rather than see failure if you didn't reach an arbitrary and distant goal. And I think you should check out the rest of her blog for a very refreshing and beginner-friendly view of Linux and programming topics, although Python features relatively rarely. Uh, anyway, getting back from the paragraph form to the sentence form, thanks, Dan, for not only making the 721 release, but also squashing that irritating and subtle bug with reload along the way. And Liz, I'm so happy to be seeing more of you. I hope we can find the chance to do a collab project someday. That's what I got. All righty. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Jerry, who is also missing the meeting today. And so I will read Jerry's. Let me do the timestamp. And Jerry just has a group hug for everyone. Uh, and so then next up is Katni. All right. So first up, uh, hug report to Liz for joining Adafruit full time. I'm looking forward to working with you more. Um, and excitingly, I have been given uh, the task of uh, teaching you to do some stuff. So. I'm really excited about that. Um, to Carter for help with yet another Arduino issue. Um, to Foamy Guy for the starter code for a CircuitPython timestamper. I built the two key version. I haven't uh, ported the code yet. And uh, to Dan for the 7.2.1 release. All right, thanks, Katni. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Sorry, Tim. I was slow on the draw on the mute button. Um, so my, my hugs this week go to first to Kevin J. Walters, uh, also goes by KJW on Discord, for some improvements for display I.O. labels, uh, particularly with way of reusing memory so you don't fragment it as much. Uh, probably particularly useful for the fixed uh, fonts, such as the built-in fonts for with terminal I.O. So thanks for that. Uh, second, Foamy Guy, thanks to you for the display I.O. and widget live stream, especially looking at all the different slidey switches and things that you've added in there. Uh, and my last hug goes to Wirehead C. Grover uh, for some tips on I2C pull-ups, uh, particularly with the Stemma QT spec, and especially for Carter and their awesome I2C guide on the, on the Learn system. So thanks, everybody. 
Alrighty, thanks, Kamech. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Kevin J. Walters. I actually forgot to put a hug report in there, so I will add one for next week, but I definitely echo the sentiments of Kmetch. Uh, Kevin J. and uh, Walters gave us some nice improvements in the Adafruit label uh, library, which I'm always excited to see. Uh, and then next up, uh, we'll pass it over to Melissa. Hello, I wanted to give a hug report to Liz for our first full-time day with Adafruit, enjoying the team, and a group hug to everyone else. All right, thanks, Melissa. Next up is Mark Gambler, who is lurking today, so I will read uh, the hug reports for them. Uh, first one to Katni um, for, uh, let's see, noticed that I had hug reports in the status updates last week, in the, uh, in the meeting note for last week. Um, hug report to me, uh, Foamy Guy, for the first deep dive and continuing the weekend streams, and a group hug to everyone. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So um, I have a hug report to, to Foamy Guy for the deep dive on Friday. It was great. Um, late breaking hug report to Liz for joining Adafruit full time and then a group hug for the community. All right. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, and next up and the last one in the hug report section will be to Scott. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Uh, I, first, a uh, hug report to you for the first uh, deep dive of yours. And uh, also, thank you to everybody who joined to watch. I uh, really appreciated that. Oh, and uh, second, uh, hug report to KMatch for working on the RGB LCD displays. They look really neat. And uh, if you look in the Show and Tell channel, you'll see the difference in speed ups that KMatch managed to get going over the weekend, which is very impressive. Exciting stuff in the display world. Um, all right, so the next section is going to be status updates. This is our time to sync up on what we're doing. This section is also held as a round robin where I will start, and then we'll go through the list alphabetically, um, giving everyone a chance to participate. Uh, when I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to tell us about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you are going to be doing uh, in the next week until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. And if a discussion becomes too much, then we will uh, move it down into the weeds section if we need to. So I will get started first. Uh, let me take a timestamp here. So my status updates this week. So uh, last week, I didn't do too much in CircuitPython land. I was uh, enjoying a small but much enjoyed and very pleasant uh, vacation. Um, but this week, I've got a couple of things that I'm about to jump into, which are uh, a typing page in the Learn Guide. This will be the Creating and Sharing a Library Learn Guide. We talked a little bit about that in the meeting last week. Um, I will be updating uh, the Display.io slider widget uh, that I mentioned a little bit before. It needs a couple of updates for the latest versions of CircuitPython. I also have some ideas to extend the functionality and a couple things I want to refactor uh, in order to get different names on stuff. And then once I've done all of that, I think we will publish that over in the CircuitPython org uh, bundle. Um, after that, I am going to be looking to use that new slider widget uh, in a PR for another new example in the AsyncIO library. Uh, this is another example that is uh, showing folks how to use AsyncIO with DisplayIO uh, interfaces. Um, this example has uh, pulls together a slider widget, a couple of round switches, uh, a label, and uh, also importantly, this one connects up to some external and built-in sensors, uh, I2C sensors to read data. Um, so bringing all of those things together and making them all play nicely with uh, async code. Um, and then the last thing I have for this week is, uh, like I mentioned just a, a little bit before, I'll be diving uh, back into uh, PRs for uh, reviews. So if you have any of the older PRs open or if you have any PR on a library, and you don't know what the next steps are, or you need help, or you just need someone to take a look, uh, again, please feel free to ping me on Discord or uh, in, the, in a comment on GitHub on the PR, um, and I will be taking a look at that stuff this week. Uh, so next up, uh, Dan H., who is missing the meeting, so I will read. Um, so today, uh, released CircuitPython 721 uh, and fixed an auto-reload issues, uh, which took uh, two PRs and perhaps made it a little less likely that there's file system damage. Now, a write to the file system causes the program to stop immediately and then wait for three quarters of a second before restarting. Uh, previously, we used to be waiting only for half of a second, so we've got a, an additional uh, quarter second in there now. Um, 
And so there were some cases previously where that half second was not quite enough and it was causing a little bit of trouble. Um, and then uh, Dan's other note here in status updates, we'll be working on making a Wi-Fi HTTP operations more robust by catching errors in our example scripts. Uh, and so next up, I will pass it over to Jeff. Oh, hello again. Uh, so last week, I found what I hope was the last problem with reading and writing Apple II floppies with Adafruit floppy, Flex Engine, and a PC five and a quarter inch disk drive. It was a command line usage error, and the Flex Engine author intends to make a change to make it better. There were two settings that had to match, and they didn't, and it caused problems. Uh, I also got Adafruit Floppy and Flux Engine working together with an Apple Disk 2 drive mechanism reading Flux. And this is great because it offers the possibility of doing a full archive of copy protected Apple Disks, including quarter tracks. Uh, this is down the line to get all the things lined up to make that happen. So that brings us to this week. I want to get writing uh, to the Apple II, the Apple Disk 2 with my custom PCB working, or else figure out why it's not. There's a possibility that an IC on the drive is damaged, or that it's a wiring problem, or that it's a coding problem. And when I got to this point late last week, my brain was kind of fried, and I'm hoping that coming at it fresh today will let me sort it out. Uh, so anyway, subsequent to that, I, there is a related pull request in Adafruit Floppy and in Flux Engine. Those have to be finished. And also, I need to coordinate with the maker of the Grease Weasel devices and Grease Weasel host computer software. Uh, basically, we need to allocate some small integer numbers to identify these Apple style floppy drives as distinct from a PC style floppy drive. Um, so all those things have to happen before this chapter is fully closed, but hopefully that's requiring less of my active time and attention and it's just getting some PRs done. Um, then after that, I'll work on implementing a format called .waz, which is named after, of course, uh, Steve Wozniak. It is a raw, for a raw flux format that's used by Apple emulators and I would add it to the Flex Engine host software so we can uh, at least read it out uh, of floppies into .waz format. Then I will get some photos and text for the Disk 2 Revolution sensor modification to go in the upcoming floppy guide. And last on my list, this is a lot for one week, investigate whether the recently added Flex Engine GUI can replace some of the command line usage that we are showing again in the same upcoming floppy guide. Uh, Flex Engine added a GUI. It looks like you can choose a lot of things, but whether you can do quite all of the command line stuff isn't clear yet. And that is what I'm up to. All righty. Thanks, Jeff. Um, next up is Jerry, who is missing the meeting. So I will read Jerry's. Let me put a timestamp here. Uh, so Jerry implemented a machine learning core capability for the LSM 6D SOX IMU uh, and added that to the library for that device. LSM 60S is the name of the library uh, and also added an example of that usage. And next up is Katni. Hello. All right. So last week I finally finished the TFT feather guide after so many bugs. Um, I added the new templates that were created for the TFT feather guide to the feather ESP32 S2 guide. I started and finished the Feather ESP32 V2 guide, which was held up by some issues, but not nearly as bad as the Feather TFT guide. And I submitted my first PR to MicroPython to expose pin 20 on the ESP32. I am unclear as to why it was not exposed, but it's used on the Feather ESP32 V2. Um, and Damien agreed that it was fine to uh, expose it for all ESP32. So um, I put in that PR. Uh, this week, uh, we began working with Liz on creating new breakout guides and updating guides for STEM QT breakout revisions. And this morning already went over a new breakout guide and provided my documentation on creating a new guide. Uh, the new guides that we will be working with are the, this, this is actually a wrong part number, the VL53, I think it's L4CD. Um, I have it written down wrong. Uh, the MCP23017 and the 1.47 and 1.9 inch TFT breakouts. Uh, and then the STEM and QT update that we have to work on is the ADXL343. I will be meeting with, uh, along with Tim, uh, with Eva this afternoon to learn how to do Adabot patches, as uh, Eva is currently the only one of us who knows how to do them. 
there's some various miscellaneous on my list. Um, I need to do the essentials template for async IO, which I may be doing in between um, working with Liz. So that may get done sooner rather than later. Um, and then I want to eventually look into getting pre-commit going on the learning guides repo. The only thing it will be doing is pilot, um, but I think it could be useful. So uh, that's not really a high priority, but it's on my list. And that's what I've got going on. Nice. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Kmatch. Hey, thanks, Mom and Guy. Uh, so the past few weeks, I've been looking at using the new port of the uh, Circuit Python that now somewhat supports the ESP32 S3 chip and development board. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the capability it has for driving displays, particularly uh, fairly simple displays without controllers, uh, sometimes called RGB displays. Uh, and to support that, I have a display that I scavenged from something else, uh, but I had a giant mess of wires that came loose a bunch. So I uh, took a diversion into KiCad and actually uh, ordered my first PCB to hopefully make that uh, connect without a bunch of janky wiring. So I hope that'll make it more reliable for further development. Uh, and we'll see how that comes out. So my next uh, thing I've been working on related with my janky wiring intact is uh, learning how to use the existing ESP uh, IDF code for bitmap drawing. I uh, learned quite a bit over the weekend of what's necessary and what's not and how to make that work. So I'm pleased with the progress and particularly figuring out how I can translate from the example code and actually take those pieces and make it work inside of CircuitPython. So that'll be my next task uh, for the coming weeks. Uh, keep exploring that and see how that fits in to and how to fit it in with CircuitPython. And uh, something else I've started on but haven't fin finalized is some updates to Cartesian widgets uh, so you can draw a bunch of lines uh, rather than just a single line. So I need to package that and get that into a PR. So that's what I've got for this week. Nice. Great stuff. Thank you, Kmatch. Uh, next Thanks. up, I will send it over to Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, last week, I updated the web serial ESP tool to work with the ESP32 C3. And I've only tested it with the dev kit because uh, I don't have the QtPi C3 uh, yet. And uh, I've tested out um, trying to get Python working with lib camera on Bullseye, but it's still quite a process at this point and doesn't work too well. Uh, I tested a bunch of other miscellaneous pull requests and created a new example for the MagTag library. This week I'm working on a potential workaround for requests not working on the matrix portal in certain situations. And I may start a new guide because it's been a while. And that's it. Nice. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. All right. So last week I worked on some technology issues with my streaming setup. Um, and I was able to do two streams on Wednesday evening and Sunday morning, Arizona time. I also figured out the cause of the issue I was having with the PICQ tool complaining about the board being too big when you try and use it to install code on uh, Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, so this week, I've got two more streams planned. I'm trying to figure out a regular streaming schedule, although my work schedule might change in a few weeks when I start my new job. So I don't know. That may change again. Um, I want to figure out a way to actually fix the issue with the PICU tool now that I've figured out what the problem is. And if I have time this week, I'd like to tackle a few more of the outstanding um, issues around type annotations in the libraries. Um, that's what I got. Excellent. Thank you, Tammy. Definitely appreciate all of your work on those. Uh, next up and last one for status uh, reports will be Scott. Hello. Uh, first, the start of the USB host API is merged in. This matches a subset of PyUSB. Um, we don't actually, or aren't actually able to talk to devices yet, but we can at least see what's been enumerated and get their USB VID, PID, manufacturer, product name, and serial number. Um, I'm waiting on TAC to do more of the low-level tiny USB work for me um, to be able to do the, actually the endpoint reading and writing. But every every day I get up and check out tiny USB, and he's making progress. So um, that's really cool. 
uh, I added support for the TT20 21100, I don't know, 21100 touchscreen driver, which is used on the ESP32 S3 box, which is a kind of dev device from Espresso. It has a nice screen, so I got that working. Um, I made a PR to update the IDF, but I need to double check that it doesn't re reintroduce the Wi-Fi slash USB concurrency issues. Um, so I'll do that before I update it, but the IDF update does fix the pin alarm bug um, with pin alarm working in light sleep and fake deep sleep. Um, so I'm going to take a look at that, and I've got some tabs open to do PR reviews and stuff as well. Uh, if you don't know, I'm expecting, my wife and I are expecting a baby uh, in 11 days. Uh, so that's a week from Friday, so I'm not trying to get into anything super large. Um, because at any point, uh, the baby could arrive at this point. <laughs> so that's me. All right. Thank you. And, uh, oh, I, sorry. I, I should say, if you need anything from me, now's a great time to reach out and tell me. Because <laughs> at some point, I'm going to disappear yep. for six weeks. Yep. Uh, all righty. Thanks, Scott. Thank um, you. So that rounds out the status updates. The next section that we have is called In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. Uh, these can be things that come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time. Uh, if you've got any In the Weeds topics, please go ahead and add them now. If you haven't already done so, uh, you can just stick them at the bottom there and we'll go through them in the order they appear. So the first one uh, was one that I had added. Uh, I will paste a link to this PR. I saw this PR go by, I think, uh, week or two ago um, and there was some question as to whether we wanted to uh, revert some of the changes in it um, or not and then I also thought it would be good if we wanted to uh, if anybody knows of some already published guidelines or if we want to maybe put together some guidelines around uh, editing the like the device info that ends up being shown on the downloads page on circuitpython.org. So I know, I think, uh, let's see, who was it? I don't remember exactly. I think it was Dan mentioned, um, opening it up here as well, mentioned uh, suggesting to revert this, uh, some of the changes from this PR. Some of them were all right, but some of them were a little bit uh, more in depth. And I think the gist of it is essentially, um, you know, do we want people copy editing the information that's on the, the .org downloads pages, or are we okay keeping whatever the original author put there, uh, even if it is, um, you know, contains a little bit of extra information or maybe is not worded in the most um, clean way and stuff like that. So I figured I would drop this one here and just um, get the uh, opinions from the community. Yeah, I think, I think, the high level is that we need to have kind of a, a, a like policy about this. Like, I think we need to. I, I appreciate that this person is coming along and doing lots of the typos and stuff. Um, like, I approve some of those PRs, but the like the marketing stuff, and I think it might have been Dishipu or somebody else pointed out that like they might like. You're you're changing the way someone else's board is worded, and is that your right to do that? And um, and then we also got a request for somebody to like clarify what what board info there is. Like this board doesn't have this and doesn't have that. And I so I think having some some guidelines and some standards for this would be good. I think Dan is being involved in this discussion, so it's probably not worth having a detailed discussion about it now. Okay. Um. I think it's worth it. I think I think we need to avoid becoming the wiki for all things as well, which is kind of the latter person of like wanting to add notes and, and example scripts and stuff. It's like that's not what it's for either. Um, I think we need to draw the line of like that's stuff that the manufacturer should provide. <laughs> yeah. And and the downloads page is not the place to have a collection of random stuff. Like we could if somebody put like Oh, I put I put this all on GitHub, and I want to link to that from here. I think that's okay, but having the content there directly is kind of inappropriate. 
So I looked at what we do with Adafruit products, and my impression is that we do basically take the marketing copy from the storefront and mm -hmm. put it on uh, circuitpython.org. So I, I think clearly we've established that some amount of what is more marketing speak than technical speak is appropriate. Right. Uh, but mm, it also looked like this particular board was maybe the most flowery and, and lengthy, or at least, you know, it, it was right up there among stuff I had read. So yeah, I think establishing guidelines, maybe there's a length suggestion or, or something, but ultimately the board makers should, should have the room to say the things about their product that they want. And we're, yeah, we're working with them and they're working with us. So I would probably be in favor of going ahead and reverting kind of the, the more style and wholesale removal of copy, but leave the stuff like that pull request also cleaned up like spacing and spelling and things like that. And it's good to, to keep that and good to recognize that there were good parts of this pull request. So that's kind seen, of my. And I've seen ones from this person that are like standardizing headers and things like that. Like, yeah, they, that is helpful in my mind. They do seem to have done a lot of cleanup work as well, but a little bit in that PR, like Jeff was mentioning, but I think there's also been other PRs and they've been doing lots of good, lots of cleanup stuff as well. It's probably worth reaching out to them to bring them onto Discord as well to be a participant in this conversation. Yep. Yeah. Which I could do. Sounds good, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you to uh, everyone. Um, and next up, uh, our other in the weeds topic today is for Mark. Mark. Yep. Perfect. Uh, just a quick couple of questions on the vein of ask Scott while he's still here. Mm -hmm. um, for the zip pull request, I did some more digging. Um, yeah. The, the gzip c python is actually written in Python, just taking advantage of the Zlib um, module itself for the, to mm -hmm. do the actual compression. Um, on top of that, I did find a good explanation I could include on what the W bits are. It's basically, are you compressing using deflate, Zlib, or gzip uh, method? So there's a sort of a standard we can tell people, use this for this type of compression. So based on sort of those two things, I think the best path forward might be to have Zlib have the decompress method, and mm -hmm. then that's compatible with uh, C Python, and we can expand on that as time and want permits. And then to have the gzip one, I can take some of the code from the C Python one, but the way they take advantage of Zlib is some of the areas that we won't have implemented right away. Mm -hmm. um, but parts of it can be, and it can be from a API point identical, uh, and then use that for the streaming file part of it. So keep both modules in there, but keep them identical to how CPython does, because I think that gives us that future expandability to the best end. Yeah, I have, I have no issue with that. Okay. If you want to do zlib.decompress, and then I think what we'll want is the gzip, gzip file or whatever it's called. It'll yeah. Be that... Whatever the IO thing is right now. It's just, yeah, it was lazy on their part. And yeah, that think makes it's sense. Be too hard to switch. Okay. Now that I just dug through all the C Python code, I figured it gives a little bit more clarity. Yeah. 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 The only thing that gzip does is compresses the file it does not you know it, zip actually com, uh, will take a group of files combine them together and then compre uh, with compression right that's yeah. under under linux and unix it's normally done by using tar g uh, tar with uh, with a switch that says also gzip the tar file so there are two different things there right we're only talking about ZLive and GZIP here. It's okay, just... that's what I wanted to make sure I understood. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we're not talking about ZIP files. Okay, that was it. Just a quick check. I figured it was easier to talk for two minutes and go okay. back and forth. And I'll, I'll write a summary into the PR too. 
Jeff Jeff is is giving them more credit than I'm giving them credit. Jeff says I suspect MicroPython deliberately made trade offs that are different. I wouldn't call it lazy. But. In particular, I looked at what they did, and it looked like they were taking care to you know avoid the excess memory allocations and all those things that they prioritize a great deal, and that we prioritize a lot less than compatibility. So it's it's the usual, and both are valid, and we're we're so, right to do what we're going to do. Yes, my my yeah. <laughs> My, Sorry, my, I, I just, you know... No, we, no, it's good, it's good. We need to not say things like lazy. We need to recognize different trade-offs, that's all. Yeah, well, they could at least name it something else. And, they, and they being lazy is a great they, trade-off, too. They technically did name it something else. It's just deceiving. Uh, but yeah, thank you for calling me out on that. All right, so I think uh, Mark has the path forward there. Yep. And that was our last item for In the Weeds. So I will take a timestamp here and do a wrap up. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March the 14th, 2022. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, please consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit. The podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Uh, this will also be featured in the Python for Microcontroller newsletter, which uh, is coming out tomorrow. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe for that. Uh, the next meeting I did look up is going to be Monday at the standard time. So that's uh, Monday the 21st, it would be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, so that will be our next meeting. We encourage all of you to join us again. Um, let's see here. Uh, this meeting, it's going to be held on the Adafruit Discord server, just like we are today, which you can join at adafru.it slash Discord. And if you uh, do get added to the CircuitPythonistas role, uh, that also comes with the benefit of you will get a notification in Discord the morning of the meeting. We usually send it out about an hour before. Um, so I uh, encourage folks to do that. And yeah, we hope to see you all next week. Thank you to everyone.